Okay, well, we'd like to again say we're thankful to be here with you all tonight. And we're talking about witnessing. This is actually number 17 in our series, Bible Marking with Chain References. We're talking about Bible marking with chain references. And this is something that a lot of Seventh-day Adventists have heard about or known about or have done. And I just want you to see it in practicality and how we do this and the idea of how to have a Bible for doing such things. So we're going to go right on into our lesson here. And the first thing we're going to talk about is having a Bible. Now, I've got a picture here of two different Bibles. And I'll just bring those Bibles up here, too, also for the forefront. This is the first one. This is a wide-margin Bible. It is, as you can see here, a Cambridge Bible. And it's, it's, it's a good leather-bound Bible. It opens and lays out nicely. And it has a, a nice marginal reference, easy-to-read text, and so on. Um, very nice paper in it, too. I have a second Bible here with me. And I'll get it out of its case here. And it's also a Cambridge Bible. But it's a Bible just like the one I just showed you, except that this Bible doesn't have a big wide margin. This one just has, as you can see, a smaller margin, whereas this particular Bible here, as you can see, it has wide margins on all four sides of the text. And so it's, it's, it's a nice study Bible for study. In fact, this is my, my desk Bible, and um, this smaller Bible is my preaching Bible. I use it for preaching. It's easy to, to maneuver and handle around. But you need a good Bible. And it doesn't mean you have to have one with wide margins. But if, if there are very short, small margins in your Bible, it will be hard if you want to make any notes or chain reference um, things. But the idea of chain referencing in a Bible is that just like you have a chain that has many links, and all those links go together to make the whole chain, so in a Bible study, you have many different Bible texts, biblical texts. And so we, what we do is we mark a text and then we note where the next link in the study is or the next text in the study will be. And by this method, we don't have to have really any notes. We can just take a Bible and we can go through a study. Maybe it's on the state of the dead. It could be on the Sabbath. It could be on anything and systematically do this. Now, there's some tools that help with this. And again, here's a picture of, of my large margin Bible. And you can see that there's a lot of room to put little notes. You, you might find a spirit of prophecy gem that you want to put uh, alongside a verse or something like that. Uh, I know that there are Bibles that have Spirit of Prophecy references in them that have been published by advanced people and so on. Uh, I like this kind of a Bible myself without any notes. Um, my Bible has no notes in it from the publishers. Uh, it's all blank around so I can put my own notes in it, and that's what I like better. Now, something you need is a ruler. And uh, you see there we have a ruler, and I'll just put it up here again. It's the same ruler, actually, that's in the picture. But it's flexible and it's mostly clear, so you can see through it. And you know that if you're getting on the line of the text that you want to mark or not. The next thing is to have a good pen. And I was surprised, I was talking with someone the other day that I, I figured I'd heard of these. Uh, and I don't, I don't sell these pens. I'm not trying to sell them, per se. But these are the best Bible marking pens I've ever seen. They're called Microns. M-I-C-R-O-N. And in the picture, you see that they have about six different thickness of pen. They have a micron 08, 05, 03, 02, 01, and then a 005. And uh, the 08 is the thickest pen, and the double aught um, 5 is the smallest or the thinnest. It has an, an extremely fine tip. And this is the one I like to use for Bible marking. It's thick enough to easily read, but it's fine enough that when you are marking in a Bible or writing a reference in the Bible, it's much easier to keep hold of. These pens come available in a rainbow of colors. Um, for instance, they show like a, a red here, an orange, brown, or maybe another orange or red. Let's say it looks like pink, red, brown, orange, green, blue, purple, and black. So there's at least those colors that we know of. 
And uh, there, you, you probably have to order them from the internet. It's not the kind of pin you can just go in and easily buy. But these pins use what is called pigmented ink. Pigmented ink. It's a type of ink that will not run if it gets wet. If you get a little bit of moisture or wetness on a page, this kind of a pen won't smear. Um, it's very nice for that. In fact, if you are ever writing checks, they, it's recommended you use this kind of a pen for writing check because you can't wash the check and, and uh, try to change it so easily. Another thing you might want to consider having is a good Bible case. Now, you don't have to have a Bible case, but if you have pens and if you have a ruler or something, you might need a Bible case like I have here, and as you see in the picture there. And this Bible case, it has a place I can put my pens, and there's places for like a, a thumb drive or little notes. There's a apartment that opens up up here, and I can put, for instance, my ruler. I can put it down in there. I can have my Bible reading and Conflict of the Ages series plan. I can put it in here, and, and so it's, it's where I know where it is. And then, of course, there's a place that zip opens to put my Bible, and it just exactly fits my preaching Bible. So it's a nice, nice case for, for that. Works really well. But those are just some tools that can make it easier for you to do a Bible marking. Now, the way we specifically do this is we would find a place in our Bible, maybe most Bibles have at least one or two pages, maybe ruled pages, that you can put notes in. And if nothing else, you usually have a back uh, page on the Bible or the, the fly leaf of the Bible or something where you can make some notes. And in this particular page on this Bible, because it has about 40 or 50 of these kind of ruled lines like you see here in the picture, um, I've put some notes for a series of Bible studies called Christ Our Righteousness, and these studies are available at Smyrna.org if you'd like to, to see them. But there's 16 different studies, and so at the top I have the title of the series, Christ Our Righteousness, and then I have the 1 through 16. The first one is called Considering Christ. The second is the Son of God. Number three, the Deity of Christ. Four, Christ as Creator. Number five, the Incarnation of Christ. Number six, creation and redemption. Uh, seven is Christ the lawgiver, and, and, and so on down. But beside each one, I also have some initials to help me to know what study I'm talking about. For instance, considering Christ is abbreviated as CC, just simply CC. Son of God, SG, Son of God. Deity of Christ, DC. And beside each one of those initials, I have a text, and this is the beginning text of the study. And so if I'm wanting to do this study on Considering Christ, we're going to talk about it tonight because it's a good study. And I know I've went through it at least once, maybe here, but uh, I think we could go through this again and be benefited by it and see how it works in practicality. So it says our first text is Hebrews 3.1. So I would open my Bible to Hebrews 3.1. And here you actually see a picture of my Bible. And here I have Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, and I've underlined it. This, this is what I'm doing. I'm underlining it. You don't have to underline the text, but just underlining it sort of helps bring it out. This particular picture and the ones you will see following may not show it quite as accurately, but the outlining or the pinning that I'm using, the pin I'm using here, is again one of those Micron 005 writers, but it's a purple one. I've done this whole series in purple. I did it in an old Bible I had in purple, so I wanted to do it in this one in purple. That way it just stands out from the other kind of studies that I may have, and so if I see the purple markings, I know that those are the Christ Our Righteousness series of studies, and it's, it's not something else. But that text begins by saying, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So the Bible gives us a command to consider Christ, to think about him, to do more than just a fleeting thought, but to consider Christ. Now, to the side in the margin, you notice, I have here something with a CC and then 2 Corinthians 3.18 after it. The CC stands for Considering Christ. That's study number one in this series. And 
This is telling me that the next text I'm going to go to is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now, why didn't I just only write down 2 Corinthians 3.18? It's because there are some studies in this series that have texts that overlap with each other. In other words, a text that may be used twice or even three times through the various studies. And this way I know the text that goes with this particular study that comes next instead of just leaving it blank. Or I may have already underlined this verse in my prior study, and I, I, I saw a Bible verse that went well with this text, and so I put that biblical verse as a little note beside it. But now if I have two or three notes there, I don't know which text to follow without the CC abbreviation. I hope that makes sense. So the CC, 2 Corinthians 3.18, tells me that the next text I'm going to go to is 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Now, we're going to see something happen when we, when we go to this text. We started in Hebrews, now we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 3.18, and when we go there, we see here's our text. And notice again, I've got it underlined, and at the end of the text, I have CC for considering Christ, and then I have 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, which will be our next text. But this text says, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is the text where we get the expression, by beholding we become changed. And this is one reason that we should consider Christ. One reason we should be beholding Him. Because as we behold Him, we become like Him. And it is a truism that God has made us in such a way that the things that we behold, we will become changed toward. And that's why God tells us to behold the good things and not the wicked things. Okay? But now notice the next text is 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. So we're going to turn in our Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. And here again you see that I have this text underlined. And you also see that I have a CC beside it with the next text, which is Romans 1, 16 and 17. But let's look at this text first. And here uh, the Apostle Paul says, writing to the church at Corinth, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul preached about Jesus. He wanted the people to understand Jesus. And you're going to notice now that we're going to go to Romans, but Think about the way that we've been pro progressing. We started in Hebrews. And we did make a jump from Hebrews to 2 Corinthians. And then we went back one more book in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Now we're going to go back one more Bible book to uh, Romans chapter 1. And what we're going to find is that this particular study has been designed in such a way that if someone is, is new to the Bible, they don't navigate through the Bible well. This study will help give them confidence because they will be very easy to navigate just going backwards or forwards just a little bit in a short, small area to be able to find the biblical verses. So we're going to go to, uh, to Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 now. And what we have on the screen is a picture again uh, from that section of my Bible and it's marked Romans 1 16 and 17. And there Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so here again is another reason to, to consider Christ, because it is the gospel of Christ and the gospel of Christ alone that brings salvation. And as we have faith in Christ, it brings righteousness with us. It says, for therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed. Now we have a note beside verse 17. And that note says, CC Acts 4, 10 through 12. But if you can see my screen, you also see that there's a little note that says faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And, and that actually goes with the study and is also just a text that I had just put in there that went well with Romans, but it's not part of this particular study. And as I said, sometimes you might have two or three references for a verse. 
And this way, by using the abbreviation, we know which text goes with the study that we're continuing in. So we're going to go to Acts. Now, the book of Acts comes just before what book of the Bible? The book of Acts comes just before which book? The book of Acts comes just before before Romans, right? Not after, but before. Now we're in Romans now. We were in 2 Corinthians, we went to 1 Corinthians, we went to Romans, and now we're go um, we're going to go to Acts and we'll see what happens. Acts chapter 4 verses 10 through 12. This is um, Peter speaking to some of the Jewish rulers. And he says, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Remember, he'd healed, he and John had been together, and there was a, a beggar by the gate called Beautiful, and he'd been healed. And then Peter goes on to speak about Jesus, and he says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which is become the head of the corner. And then he says this great verse, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So friends, there's no other name. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It, it, it's not the president. It's no one else but Jesus. And this is another reason that we should consider and think about Jesus and put him first and foremost in what we do, because there's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we can be saved. Now, we went from Hebrews originally to 2 Corinthians, and then we just came back one book to 1 Corinthians. We came back one book to Romans. We've come back one book to Acts. What book comes just before the book of Acts? the book of John. And that's where we're going to go next. And we have a little note here, CC, considering Christ, John 14, 6. So we're going to go to John 14, 6 now. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Again, another reason to consider Christ, because he is our only access to the Father. He says, I am the way. What is the way of? He's the way to God. He says, I am the truth. What are you the truth about, Jesus? I'm the truth about God. I'm the truth about the Father. And he says, I am the life. He brings the life of the Father to us. And he says, no man comes to the Father but by me. Now we have a note here. It says, CC, John 3, 14 and 15. So our next text is going to stay in John. It's easy to find because we're in the book of John. Now I added the book John here. But I really didn't have to. If I had just written 3, 14, and 15, we would know by implication that that verse is for the same book. If there's not a book mentioned, we know we could be staying in the same book. So I could write it as John 3, 14, and 15, or I could just put 3, colon, 14, comma, 15. But I went ahead and wrote John here. But let's go over to John. Uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Here you see, if you, if you have a chance to see the actual text, I have John 3, 16 uh, in red, underlined in red. It's just a, a standout verse. But I've, in my purple, have used uh, it to underline verses 14 and 15. And there it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so again, we're lifting up Jesus, because in him we have eternal life. In him we need not perish. Now, Moses lifted up a literal serpent on a pole. And Jesus was lifted up on the cross of Calvary. But friends, as we lift him up, as we lift him up as the Son of God, as we lift him up, as deity, as we lift him up as the Son of Man, as we lift him up as the Savior of the world, as we lift him up in these various capacities with which God has given him, then we are drawn to him and um, we can have eternal life. Now our next text and its reference is CC John 12, 32. But again, I didn't have to write the word John here. I could have just put 12, 32, and we would have known that that meant to go to the same book, chapter 12, verse 32. 
So let's go to John 12, 32. And again, we have an actual photograph from my Bible. And we have John 12, 32 here highlighted. And here Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And again, this is going making reference back to also to John 3 and uh, verse 14 and so on there. And uh, Jesus, when we lift him up, men are drawn to him. Now our next text we know is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, because there's a little CC. I've written a little CC right beside that verse. And beside that I've put Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Now I've abbreviated most of these biblical books names. Uh, I didn't write out the word Hebrews because it's just, it takes room. And you have a limited space in your margin, so you may need to abbreviate, and that's fine. But let's go to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Notice he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginner, the end of our faith. He's the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we can consider Christ in this sense. And as we do, we look to him as the author and finisher of our faith. Now, if you notice at the end of verse 2, I have a CC, and then I just have a V period 3. V period 3. That stands for verse 3. We're just going to go right on to verse 3, because if we actually were doing this with the actual study itself, there's questions with biblical text for the answer. There would be a different question for Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 than there is for 3. But this verse 3 tells us what happens as we look to Jesus. And it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. In this particular text, where you see the word contradiction, in my Bible I've just put a little asterisk there in red. And to the side, I put that the Greek for this is antilaga, which means hostility. This word that we translate contradiction of sinners, it means hostility. And so we could read it like that. For consider him that endured such hostility of sinners. And it says that when we do this, when we consider him, like we read in Hebrews 3.1, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. When we consider him, it says that we do not become faint and wearied in our minds. And friends, the battle's for the mind, isn't it? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the battle is for the mind. And as we consider Christ, as we consider uh, especially his passion, the crucifixion, it gives us strength in our minds so that we don't become weary and faint along the way. Now, we need wisdom. And in James chapter 1 and verse 5, we'll see in just a minute the next verse. But I have a picture here I want to show you first. And that is sometimes when you're opening a Bible and you're trying to mark in it. If you're right in the middle of the Bible, it may not be too hard. But if you're near the beginning or near the end of the Bible, the, the, the Bible, it sort of opens a, a, in an asymmetrical way. You have a big hump on one side and a little thin hump on the other side. And so what I'm showing here is putting a book or some kind of a height uh, elevating mechanism <laughs> under the thin side. And what that does, that helps push up so that if I'm writing on the, um, the, the, the high side, or in this picture, the left side, it's much easier to get in and write near the crack uh, and, and to get the use of the whole margin as opposed to that. But now going to James 1.5. Here he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and it brighteth not, and it shall be given him. I think we're all familiar with this text. It tells us that if we lack wisdom, that we can ask of God and he will give it to us. And I believe that. Now the next reference, notice in my Bible here, it has CC, COL period, 2 colon 1 through 3. Now what would COL stand for as an abbreviation? 
If it was a spirit of prophecy no, reference, okay. Christ object lessons would be a very good one, but we're talking about a biblical reference. What biblical reference would be COL? That would be Colossians. That would be Colossians. There really is no other book that a COL abbreviation fits well. But you can abbreviate or write it out however you need to so that you know what the reference means. But it says go to Colossians 2, 1 through 3. We're talking about wisdom here now. And now notice here, I've done something a little different in the way that I have underlined, if you please, these verses. There's three verses here. And instead of underlining every line of each verse, I've only underlined the very beginning line. I've underlined the last line of verse 3, and then drew a diagonal line across from the end of the first line to the beginning of the first, showing that the underlining continues. Now, you could underline it all, or you could do this. You don't have to underline any, but it just helps me to see that that's the unit, and I remember from reading my last chain reference that I'm supposed to be in Colossians 2, 1 through 3, so this helps me to, to focus in on that section, not forget where I'm supposed to be. And, and then we have our reference after that. But let's read this text. Paul says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we're talking about wanting to have knowledge about Christ, wanting to have knowledge about God. It says that in James 1, 5, if we lack wisdom to ask, and God will give to all men liberally. And here it says that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in God and Christ. Now our next text is Romans 1, 22 and 23. And you notice that we have a little CC beside this reference again. This way we know it's about considering Christ. We've been to the book of Romans before, so again, it shouldn't be too hard to find. Here it is. Let's see, I think I've got 22 and 23, and I don't have this slide perfectly shown here. So let me go back and um, let me read that. I have to read it out of my Bible here because I got part of it cut off, it looks like, and I'm sorry for that. Romans chapter 1. Verses 22 and 23. It says, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things. And so there's a group of people, and they profess themselves to be wise, but they are foolish. And 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 he says that they just changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like corruptible man or a beast. Now, the next reference is 1 Corinthians 1.24. Notice again, there's a little CC beside it, so we know which reference to go to. And there we have this text. Paul says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Again, Christ is that wisdom of God. And we have here beside this CC. The CC stands for Considering Christ. And then we have a V period 30. So we didn't write out 1 Corinthians 1.30. We just went to verse 30 next, okay? And verse 30 states this. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In Christ, friends, we have wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Everything that we need we find in Jesus Christ, all the more reason that we should put our thoughts and our focus upon him. Now, you see to the side I have the word wisdom, although part of it got cut off, Psalms 90, verse 2, but that's not part of this study. First of all, it's in the wrong color. It's in blue, not in purple. But you notice at the end of the verse, I have the word end, E-N-D, C-C, end, C-C. That means that's this is the end of the study on considering Christ. We're at the very end of this study. There, there's no more to this study. It helps us to know when we're over because we put end there. Now, I, I want to share with you a couple statements from the testimonies. And this first statement was written in around 1890. It was published in the uh, March 11th re of the review in 1890. And it's paragraph 13. I've got it broken into two parts, so it's a little easier to see here. 
But Ellen White writing at that time, she says, Brethren, shall we not all of us leave our loads there? And when we leave this morning, may it be with the truth burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet with those who will say, You are too much excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. Now, that's what she says you'll hear people say. Oh, you're talking too much about the righteousness of Christ. You should be preaching the law. And then she says, As a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Goboa that hath neither dew nor rain. And then she continues, We must preach Christ in the law, and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eye salve. We must draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to us, if we come in his appointed way. Oh, that you may go forth as his disciples did after the day of Pentecost, and then your testimony will have a living ring, and souls will be converted to God. Friends, there are times you can't talk to people about the law. They don't want to hear about the law. There will be times you can't talk to people about the Sabbath because they're just not open to hearing about the Sabbath. But when you can't talk about anything else to the people, you can talk to them about Jesus. Talk to them about his person, the beauty of his character, the compassion of his heart, the love of his soul. And, and, and that can open the door to preaching about the law and Christ and the law and, and other things. Here's a statement from the youth instructor of January 1, 1856. It's paragraph 4. Let your thoughts dwell upon things of earth less and upon heaven more. When you are with your associates, talk about Jesus instead of dress and appearance. Do you love Jesus? If you do, you will love to talk about him. Do you love his appearing? If you do, you will love to dwell upon it. Does heaven charm you? Does it attract you? If so, you cannot hold your peace. I like that, don't you? And so, friends, we can talk about Jesus. And in fact, if Jesus is really in our hearts, we'll want to talk about him. Now, I have one more text or reference I'd like for you to give you. And this is from Manual for Canvassers, page 37. It's also found in Culporter Ministry, Culporter Evangelist, and other places. It says, God will impress those whose hearts are open to truth and who are longing for guidance. He will say to his human agent, speak to this one or to that one of... She doesn't say the law. She didn't even say the Sabbath. She didn't say the seal of God. She says, speak to this one or to that one of the love of God. Jesus. And now I'm going to read to you a promise that I, I have been claiming now for over 45 years. Every time I go into a home, or I visit with people, or I'm studying the Bible with people, I'm meeting someone, this reference comes to my mind so often. No sooner is the name of Jesus mentioned in love and tenderness than angels of God draw near to soften and subdue the heart. I've, I've met some people that were pretty rough in their time, and maybe you have too. But in talking with those people, I find that when I speak the name of Jesus in a tender way, with love, that I know I have the promise that angels of God are going to draw near to soften and subdue the heart because of the mighty and the wonderful name of Jesus. And so, friends, I encourage you to study um, Christ and present Christ to the people and you'll never go wrong. You'll never be sorry. And uh, until next time, may God bless you lots and lots and lots.